<laughs> okay, welcome everybody to uh, this is June's uh, North Bay EAA meeting, and we have a number of members from lots of different places, uh, as usual. And oops, I'm getting the right scope here. And today um, we're going to go through. Uh, the normal events, uh, and uh, Cecilia is going to show us a little bit, I hope, about uh, what she's been doing on, on the web. And uh, then Zeno is going to wrap up his urban mobility. And if he's, if he runs out of material, I'll start covering what the California Air Resources Board said about um, uh, their mobility efforts as well, and what incentives look like. It was really in, uh, um, interesting stuff. So let's start with induction, introductions and who you are and how you get around. I'm Jerry Glazer. Um, I volunteer to be president of the North Bay EAA. And so that's the title I have uh, for this year. By the way, um, it's turned out to be a little bit more fun than I expected because uh, I get invited to things that Alan used to get invited to. And I didn't even know he got invited to all this stuff, uh, including um, representatives uh, in Congress want to you know, have meetings and stuff like that. So um, others who are thinking, Sonia's lined up for next year to be president and uh, others think about signing up to be vice president next year with the obligation of being the president the following year. David, you got here first. Um, oh, by the way, I'm driving a leaf. <laughs> okay, you're up. Uh, Dave Heacock, I live in Fairfield, um... I have a 1985 a Bonnie that I converted to electric and uh, I'm about ready to get close to taking all the individual cells out and putting in uh, eight modules, which will simplify the wiring. And uh, I've been working with Thunderstruck on this. It's gonna be pretty interesting. Hopefully it'll up my range to around 120 miles, which is more than I'll ever use. So. When we come up to the news, uh, I'll bring up a point about modules uh, because it, it showed up in the news this uh, um, uh, this last month. Well, Al, <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. Al. Al is uh, in Petaluma. He's driving a uh, I-Pace, 2019 I-Pace. Okay. Sonia, you're next on my screen. Hi, uh, Sonia here. I drive a Model 3. Um, I went to San Jose last weekend. Uh, I didn't think a lot about plugging in and I just ran into, you know, an extra 40 miles that I needed at some point. Um, and I'm talking to some friends uh, this afternoon who want to, you know, buy an EV and do a lot more uh, inside the U.S. traveling to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, and uh, I'm going to post in the chat if anyone has advice for how I should advise them. Just let me know in the chat. Thanks. Uh, Cecilia, you're up next. Hi, I'm Cecilia. Um, I drive a 2018 Model 3, and um, I'm glad to be here today. I'm glad to have you. Brad? Yeah, I'm Brad Morrison. I bike and take the bus a lot, but when I'm not, I drive a 2004 Honda Civic Hybrid and I'm hoping to get an EV eventually. There's a lot of models that are now available. Caleb. So I'm in Southern California in Orange County. I drive a 2015 BMW i3, um, although rarely. <laughs> and I've been looking at lots of EVs lately, but I noticed I, I saw my first uh, Volkswagen ID4 yesterday driving around in the in, in the forest. <laughs> hey, uh, come closer to the microphone next time. You're a little bit light, right? Oh, yeah, it's my webcam. It's your webcam. I mean, that's the same thing with my webcam, right? Zeno, you're up. Uh, uh, I'm Zeno Schweiting. I live in Sebastopol. Um, I drive a Honda Insight and a bicycle. <clears throat> Mr. Palmerly. Okay. Um, still drive the green Geo Metro. Drove it up to Chico a weekend or two, two weekends ago, and it worked great. So that was nice to have it 
still performing after all these years with a 2008 battery pack. So <laughs> pretty good. What's that battery pack made out of? What, what? It's, it's kind of a, a Tesla like pack It's little Panasonic cells. There's um, uh, 50 of them in parallel, you know, and so it's a, it's sort of a, it's like that. Okay. It's 96, 96 times 50. <laughs> okay. Tor, you're up. Hey, uh, <clears throat> let's see, driving a 2020 Bolt and a bicycle around Sebastopol. Okay. Mike. Hi, everybody. Um, Mike Mule from Santa Rosa. Um, my 2011 Leaf is still going strong, driving it right now. My uh, 2020 Kia Niro EV has been in the shop for three weeks. We were Ooh. driving it just just uh, north on 115 out of Sebastopol, and it, and it just the uh, check electric vehicle sensor came on, and the drive, drive system went to nothing. And... Uh, Supposedly it has a sensor that's detecting that the battery is overheating when it's not. And so they had to send to Korea for parts. So uh, it's um, uh, an odd, odd sensation when you're driving an EV and then you have no power. Um, I also put a deposit down on a Ford Lightning and see if that comes out better than the Nikola did. <laughs> That's it for me. Good. And David Harris. Yes, good morning. Um, so we have a 2017 Bolt and uh, we leased a two, a two year lease on a 2020 Leaf, which is our fourth Leaf. And wow. I've experienced with it times when I push on the accelerator and it does nothing. And I'm still puzzled, Is you know, you talk to the dealership and they said, oh, they never heard of this. So. Yeah, you know, my, my 2018 Leaf had spent uh, five, six weeks in the shop when I first got it. It's been solid since then, but it had to do with the wiring harness. They need to replace the wiring harness. Something's okay. low cost item, but it took three repairs before they finally figured that out. Okay. Bernie, yeah, oh, Bernie, you're up. Yeah. Okay, I'm not even seeing myself. I wasn't sure I was. You were there. You were there just a second ago. We saw your shoulders. Okay, good. Um, anyway, I still have my Model Three you know, and a Leaf and uh, clickers on the roof and and just plodding along. Okay, good. Ellen, are you out in the garden, Ellen? You're on mute. Okay, you can't find the button, or you're not there. Okay, we'll continue on. But by the way, I have I finally have the solar panels on my roof too. And last month, uh, with my batteries and my solar panels, including all my driving, all the natural gas that we used, and all the electricity, PG&E told me that they owed me seven dollars. So. Uh, uh, it, it looks like uh, it works really well. And, and I actually questioning how much solar you need on your roof if you insulate the house. Um, because uh, if you follow the spec that they have, it was very interesting. The spec for Sebastopol is I need uh, five kilowatt hours, uh, five kilowatts on my house. If you take the California spec and which includes your insulation, your batteries and whatever else in the calculation, they say that we need 3.1, which is about how much we actually need. So they've got it right. Okay. Chapter business. Not much change here. Um, uh, uh, David Harris, I think you just renewed your membership. Uh, and a couple other people renewed their membership. So we're still running it. Uh, actually, I think we have 38 paying members now. Um, I haven't checked on our balance or how we tap our balance. Mike, uh, you've done that before. Have you gotten money from the NBAA, uh, from EAA, from our funds? Yeah, there's um, in that, uh, in the place where you find the handbook, um, yeah. it's also a form for reimbursement or, or um, but yeah, you fill that okay. out. Um, technically, the, the chapter treasurer has to sign it. And um, I think still on record, our chapter treasurer is probably uh, uh, 
Stacy Ireland. I'm sorry if I missed. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. um, um, we haven't had any problem. I mean, we haven't got yeah. a reimbursement in quite a while, yeah. but but you know, it's not being abused. So I don't think they're okay. being that uh, critical. Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the things that we might talk about uh, at some point is what equipment we might buy in order to keep this extended. Um, very nice brain. Uh, yeah. <laughs> keep this extended. Right, right button. Yeah, uh, keep this extended uh, um, membership working really well with folks that are that are off site, so they can feel like they're in the room or as close to in the room as possible. Um, the other thing which we did, I don't know if we spent the money on it or how it was done, but Alan had renewed the Zoom license again for the next year. He didn't do it the way I wanted to do it. I wanted to renew it, and, and if uh, somebody else ends up doing it next year, and not me do it through the EAA. And if we do it through the EAA, the price is exactly the same price, but we actually get more capability. Um, so, because they have a, a, a group membership. Just remind everybody, send the news. Uh, we got a, a light amount of news. I guess Alan was in the middle of his move to Foster City. And uh, uh, so uh, he usually was the most newsworthy person sending uh, news uh, links to the NBA dash team. Um, so if you see something that's interesting, uh, send the news off. Did I scribble? I did scribble on here. How did I do scribbles on here? Cecilia, how do I erase the scribbles I just did? I don't know how I did those. They're on the screen. I'm not sure. Do you have the annotation tools up? They said Ellen McKnight on the scribbles. <laughs> But actually, yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm on this screen. Maybe it's in, in here. I don't know how I did that, and I don't know how to erase it. <laughs> Wait a second. We have a lot of scribbles. Just a second. And it's, it's going from slide to slide. Give me one second here. Oh, I won't even do that. Oh, because I'm sure. I don't know. No, Ellen's name shows up for a second every time there's a scribble. Is that right? Oh, it's Ellen scribbling. Oh. Well, Ellen, that's interesting. You don't know how to get on, and you're scribbling all over the screen. That, hmm. You might want to use chat instead. Hang on. Just be on an iPad. Okay. Well, I'm getting even more on my screen, just a second. Oh, I see what it is, just a second, I know what it is. Let me do this. She became a presenter. <laughs> I have to stop her from being a presenter. Who, me? Uh, and yeah, you, it looks like you've been presenting and scribbling on the screen. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to unmute. Well, that's, Pretty good. Now I'm trying to figure out how to take your screen off of my screen. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can do it. See if you can stop sharing. Stop sharing. How do I stop sharing? So Jerry, um, you can turn off annotate because it's just the annotate that she's using. On the yeah. Model. If you go to on on your yeah. presenter screen. Yeah. Um, go to on, on your bar where it says more or the ellipsis is. No, I actually have an annotate button. Right, but this is for the since you're since you're the presenter, you can disable yeah. annotates. You, you can disable. Oh, there we go. Disable annotate for others. Annotation. Yeah, well, it didn't go away. Uh, and I can't clear it either. Sorry. Let me, let me stop the share, and I'm going to reshare just a second. And that might be the way for me to do this. Yeah, I did that so that when Zeno came in, uh, normally I would have the other person's presentation, but Zeno didn't want to give it to me. So um, I had to enable some other stuff here. Okay, does that look better? <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. Okay. So anyway, uh, think of doing a presentation. Um, we have uh, somebody lined up uh, for the next meeting and the meeting following that, if uh, it's still interesting, 
uh, and timely. Um, I'll cover what the CARB had talked about. I created that presentation just in case. And you have to stop noshing now, Cecilia, because right here, the website continues to be a work in progress. And uh, now you can go ahead and, and uh, take the screen. I'll stop sharing. All right. Okay. All right. Are folks able to see the screen? Okay. Yep, it's there. Okay. So I've been working on an updated site. This is um, primary focus uh, recently has just been on um, putting together the structure, putting together the different features uh, that uh, the web team has been discussing for the site. There is still design work to be done, so this is not going to be like the final look. So um, this is the homepage. This is uh, basically kind of similar to what we already have. Next meeting coming up. Um, you have to join the club page, which is also very similar, same structure, all those things. But now this is where we get to uh, something that's a little bit different. I also have a meetings page where we can have a list of meetings. So you can see previous meetings, what these things are. And if you click onto a meeting, You'll also get uh, a link to the slides. You'll have the video oh, meeting right there. So it's a lot easier for folks to, you know, come find a specific meeting on the website and 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 do all that. Um, so there's also a calendar feature, which is not fleshed out. Um, local goings on. This will be where we put um, any like activities we're doing or any you know initiatives that are happening. We can share those here and there's nothing here. Um, resources? Oh, yeah, I was going to say on the calendar, uh, mm -hmm. one of the things you might look at, um, the EAA has a calendar which is shared with all of us as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can put our events on there if we want to. I haven't explored that at all. Okay. Um, and uh, if we did that, then we'd have our events and we could also see events for other um, chapters. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, resources. This is where we can put um, all the different things that um, we find we think are useful, especially for like new EV owners or people looking into EVs. Uh, people want to do research. Um, I have a few items in here, um, uh, and this will just link off to um, these different sites. So um, I'm going to stop sharing this screen. There's also a back end version of the site. And this will see where's my window. There it is. Okay. Come back to Zoom. Let's share. Okay. So the site is is built in Drupal. Ah. Now if mm -hmm. we go into the back end of the site, we can see all the different pieces of content that have been created for for the site so you can go in and edit any, any page um, you can also edit just from front page if you're if you have edit access come in and edit as a nice um, editor do all the things there um, one nice thing about doing um, using this system is that it's very easy to make um, lists of contents for example the meetings um each of these meetings the individual piece of content as you add more content it'll show up automatically in this list so we can go back i've actually went in and put in all the meetings that we had um that were online so, so, so the, page, the page is presenting the list and you mm -hmm. just update the list okay you just you just add a piece of content and it automatically goes into the list okay great Okay. And um, another feature that's not quite, it's not quite um, fully um, flushed out with like content, but um, there is a related section. And the way that this works is you have tags that you can add to meetings if there's like something that we talked about in particular. Uh -huh. um, if we have like a resource or something that local going on, it can also um, be linked here automatically based on how the things are tagged. Okay. And nice structure, Cecilia. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it has, um, it looks like Drupal has the embed embedding capability so that the video plays right on the screen and you don't leave. Uh -huh. That's pretty nice. Um, yeah, looks good. So have you set it up yet? Uh, I know we're just about, I um, hope, hope we're coming to the tail end of the pandemic. Uh, set it up so the, the web team can meet again and uh, they, you can train everybody on this as well so that uh, you can get multiple people to help you work on this. Yes, yes, definitely. And, a, and, a, and I assume you're soliciting all the members for additional content. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, 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 if you have like the photos of, of like your EVs, uh, if you have um, stories you'd like to share, I think we could even, if we wanted to, um, go in the route of adding um, like a blog or something so that members could share just like, you know, their thoughts or feelings about things. That's, um, you know, something else that we can explore. Good. Um, uh, one more thing, yeah. um, the, yeah. the old site, the, the previous site, the site that before the one that's, that's out currently, there is a lot of content that's there that I would like to um, migrate over to this new site as well, so that we have that um, on this site as well. So, and, and once you're um, you, once you're ready, then we'll just switch the DNS to go off to this, then, right? Uh, we'll 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 set it up on on the hosting uh, uh, for this for the site, and then we can switch it over to DNS. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, so, is there any way to? Uh connect with social media like uh some websites i've seen you can like uh if an organization has a facebook page or a twitter page yeah. you can have like um like a dump on that or a, a feed from that website or that yes yes, yes we could. Um, and then are we uh, are we on social media at all no. maybe the national organization or the national organization has Facebook. They have an abandoned Twitter account, and um, our our group has a the YouTube um, videos. Yeah. Right. So we, you could link to that, or or have a yeah, it's it's linked here at, at the bottom. Yeah. But, and but the feed often like the an image of the latest or. Like if you have a Facebook page, you you kind of show the last three postings, that kind of thing. We um, we don't keep a Facebook page, and neither does the national site right now, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the national site has a Monday? Facebook page, but the I don't I don't know if they're keep. I think they're keeping it updated. Kind of. Yeah. yeah, I don't. For me, it would be difficult. Anyway, I don't use social media. So. <laughs> the only thing I do is the YouTube, and I didn't even think of that as as social media. It was just a place for us to make the uh, videos of our meetings uh, publicly available. Um, oh, people can give commentaries on the videos, and that makes it like social. Right? Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, people. I mean, at least in many cases, people allow commentaries. Uh, see, I, I didn't see that, Zeno. You know, when I set the the uh, YouTube channel up, I didn't see anything about turning on uh, commentaries. So that might be something to, to look at later on. Uh, Cecilia, the other thing is, uh, if you want a solicitation from the general club, uh, you have the login for the NDAA 2019 user ID. And that one's allowed to send to NDA-club, which will send to everybody. So if you want to um, get more input, Okay. I, I, I don't think that uh, you were set up to, we set it up so that we had a very small mailing to uh, to club. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was kind of surprised that I had it. And I, I've started using NBA 2019 to send things out instead. Okay. Okay. All right. Can Great. I ask a follow-up question? Um, you know, it's sort of, right now it's, it's all the meeting, back meeting uh, information on the website. And it looks like that's, what it'll be initially but as far as um what else could be posted i would just imagine you know maybe not now but exploring things like the, <clears throat> the questions sonia asked um that are common questions for people shopping for evs you know how, mm -hmm. how can we help that audience mm -hmm. and if i'm sending a picture about my car or my experience you know it needs a little more structure or thought put into why is that going to help somebody? Um, 
so that would that would just be an interesting sort of conversation to have at some point to say what's the point of what else we put on the um website and if it's to get you know encourage other people to take a road trip or point out whatever um just think of it in those terms what what is the you know this should be an advocacy kind of group and mm -hmm. so we're, we've been a little um, I, I said but in, Tor, thinking in the past so Tor, i, I uh, saw that cecilia did do some of that already on that one page she was showing to us so it'll okay. be a question of what content do we want to have there and i think she wants to solicit that from the from the membership great does um drupal have built-in seo or like keyboards? uh he, that's a tla i don't know could you tell me what seo is? search engine optimization thank so you <laughs> when people are when people google a question like is the kia nero reliable and then you know uh it, it, uh -huh. it just happens to match something that someone said uh it'll match up uh, there are options for for seo i um i've started to work on that a little bit as well great all right, any more questions? We'll, we'll keep moving forward in the meeting then. All right, and then I have to go share again and everything moved on my screen again. And I had one other question about a website. Mm -hmm. um, I, it shows that not secure, uh, and that maybe that's not a problem, but uh, for the future, if we do more with the website, um, it would be good to kind of uh, create an HTTPS uh, account for this, so you kind of can do membership renewals and that kind of thing, things that require a little bit more security. Except the membership renewals and all of that go through the EAA. And once you I, get there, it would switch I'm just, you. I'm just giving an example. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah the, the site will have uh, uh, HTTPS by default. Yeah. Oop, there was your demo. OK. Um, OK. So our previous meeting, uh, the video is available. Uh, and there's a link. But uh, once uh, Cecilia, you but actually, even on the existing site, uh, uh, you can link to that. And the presentation, uh, one of the things that uh, Zeno suggested was that uh, I include the link in the description on the videos. So the link to the uh, previous uh, presentation um, material also is available on the YouTube channel. There's no uh, EV events and offers that I know of. <laughs> and nobody said anything yet. The big news. Uh, first, the big news was what's happening with the oil, oil companies in the boardrooms. Um, Shell has been very aggressive about becoming uh, greenhouse gas neutral uh, within a certain period of time. And yet uh, the courts in the Netherlands said, no, you have to go twice as fast. Uh, so now talking about a 45% drop over uh, 2019 emissions by 2030. Um, Chevron, which is probably the worst of the oil companies as far as being progressive in, uh, I went to a presentation they had at Stanford by Chevron on all of their efforts uh, tackling greenhouse gases. It was embarrassing. Anyway, <laughs> the shareholders <laughs> have now voted that scope three, I hadn't heard, heard this term before, that Chevron has to uh, cut um, uh, is scope three emissions. Scope three emissions is the emissions caused by the consumers of your product. Did ever, anybody else know that? You know what that was? You know that term? That was a new term to me. Exxon. <laughs> Shareholders elected three environmental advocates to the board over the management objections. Um, and it seems that institutional investors are now focusing on the future instead of uh, on the quarter, which is really uh, interesting to see. Um, and we can see also uh, over here uh, uh, how much fossil fuel has dropped as far as gas stocks, the value of the stocks uh, years ago, um, 20 years ago, uh, DGNI 
well, our investments were always in green things and our financial investors always say, you need to invest in uh, oil and gas because that's where the earnings are. Well, everybody's moving away from it. And our investors now even say, yeah, don't invest in oil and gas. Uh, and that's not the growth area. So can, I'm, can we talk a bit about this? I'm uh, sure. still confused about the Shell, for example, because basically uh, these companies sell greenhouse gases, right? No, but so, so I can tell you about Shell because they gave a priest. Let me they give a presentation. Okay, go ahead. Let me finish. Um, so is the shell what the court said in the Netherlands? Did the sh does the, is the shell going to reduce how much oil they sell? Or is it just uh, the scope one and two emission? This is from their internal operations. No, it, it included scope three for them as well. And the the um, the point for Shell was Shell wasn't sure how to do this yet. I mean, this just came up and their point says, well, we'll take it to the courts because we don't know if we can do this. But Shell had identified, um, including all of their products, that by 2050, uh, they wanted to be an energy company and, and not uh, an oil and gas company. They might still have some oil and gas, but um, they wanted to get to be net zero uh, all the way through scope three by 2050. And they have been very active, um, in, including they have a board member whose own, his only focus is, you know, how do, how do we do this? How do we change who we are? Uh, BP is doing the same thing. And uh, we might see that in the next slide. Um, yeah, but they, what, what if another company comes up and starts selling these gallons of oil that Shell doesn't sell? I mean- So that, that's, an, you know, that's an interesting <laughs> one, Zeno, you know, because that actually has been happening the oil and gas companies have been selling off the gas, um, um, I don't need to call them wells, the natural gas uh, facilities that they have, which have been polluting. So they've been selling them to smaller companies so that they don't have them anymore. But the smaller companies now have them. So the problem didn't disappear. It just got moved to somebody else. So that needs to be addressed. And that was actually in the news in the last month as well. So yeah, I mean, this is the beginning that they're even discussing it and they're being pushed. Um, and Jerry, did yeah. you notice that uh, CalSTRS and CalPERS and like New York State Life, it, they were all the activist investors? Yeah, they were. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that when, when I talk about that, that's why I had that bullet down here highlighted with a, its own space, that it's the institutional investors which are now saying, OK, we need to do something about this. Um, Frank Bloom was highlighted uh, with Storage X recently, and he covered, he's responsible for um, the battery business at uh, Volkswagen. Um, and they've revised their EV percentage from 30% by 2030, that they will be 60% selling EVs. Uh, and part of their plan was they developed a closed loop design for their vehicles, uh, a net zero closed loop design. So it starts with uh, the cells and they're using three chemistries. Then they have a battery system. And there's some more points about that coming up with an industry standard format. That's why uh, Dave, um, one of the things that they've gone away from is cells. And they're actually talking about a standardized package that would not just be used in Volkswagen, they're pushing for a standardized package, um, um, a format to be used in all vehicles. Um, very much like the kinds of things we see with uh, 12 volt batteries because they only come in N number of uh, packages. Um, then they have the first use, which is clearly mobile applications. They're already uh, building up a business division for the second use, just like Tesla, uh, for stationary systems after the first use is done. And those batteries that they're putting together will have about an eight year life. And then the second use will have even further. They're building already their recycle factories because there's plenty of uh, lithium ion batteries out there that aren't in vehicles for recycling as well. And there they maintain that 95% of the material will be recoverable. The only thing that they can't recover is the separator. Um, so they designed, including for you, Zeno, the embedded GHGs. So their design for net zero says, uh, we have to include the cost of manufacturing the vehicles. That is the GHG cost. Um, they bought three battery companies. 
They increased their engineering team. This is unbelievable. Over a three-year period uh, in batteries and battery systems from 25 people to 2,000. Um, so they're fast tracking. And their first uh, a full battery uh, production plant will be in full production in four years. They're using a standard skateboard like GM uh, for the new vehicles so they can reduce uh, um, the customization from vehicle to vehicle. And um, lithium iron phosphate, they targeted for city cars. So um, I gave an earlier presentation on that. They should have lower cost, even though they cost more today because they're coming from a small number of places. They have a longer life and they have a shorter range, uh, they have a shorter range than um, uh, for uh, the other chemistries because of the density, uh, uh, the energy density. Um, what they said was in their vehicles, the battery volumes are limiting designs. That is how physically big the batteries are, not the weight, the physical size of the batteries. And that's one of the reasons that they're um, really interested in the uh, solid state because physically solid state batteries are much smaller and they expect EV manufacturing costs to drop below internal combustion engine manufacturing costs uh, fairly soon. Now, let me add a bit to, to this. Uh, so there's a law in, in, in Germany and maybe in other European countries that car manufacturers have to take back the car at the end of the life cycle. Yeah, it's Germany, yeah. And uh, a lot of these uh, design features and initiatives are uh, not like uh, initiatives of Volkswagen, but they kind of come out of the uh, that whole the, trend yeah. in, in, in Germany and, and maybe other elsewhere in the world of having like a closed loop uh, society mm -hmm. or zero waste society where um, like there are uh, carpet companies that, that uh, are committed to take back the carpet at the end of your use and they recycle the materials. So that's kind of part of this uh, story. Yeah, and, and I think it's more than just cars. John? Well, yeah, I was curious, you know, that's so great. Um, is it possible that the design, because they're using the skateboard design or whatever, would allow them to take, for instance, a chassis back and just simply clean it up and paint it and put it in a new car? It, it, it might be possible, but you would think that they'd want to change the designs. I think more than anything, they're going to recycle the materials. I'm guessing. I mean, it, I, yeah, if you look at from a. It is true that this law has led to redesign. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. if I'm responsible for getting the car back at the end of the, its lifetime, uh, I want to make sure that I uh, don't have to invest a lot of money in, in taking it apart. So yeah. So it has maybe become more modular, as, as you guys suggest. And my understanding is, you know, is it more than just cars that, that had to do with products in general? That um, yeah. the cost, the, they assess the cost up front uh, for uh, disposal of the product at the end. Um, he continued on and he talked about why their marketing forecast is, is the way it is. He said, today people are willing to pay for range. They think that once people get used to EVs, that will discontinue and that shorter ranges will what, be what people will look for. Uh, with, a, uh, with a stronger charging network, uh, faster charging, under 10 minutes, and, uh, and they expect, and they actually have been producing 500 amp charge stations, though there's not a lot of vehicles to take that. This was their example uh, over on the right-hand side. Um, uh, today, the charging time is about 25 minutes for fast charges. Uh, by 2025, they're looking at 17 minutes. By 20, uh, and then after 2025, their target is 12 minutes down to 10 minutes. And what I'm showing you here is uh, one of the stations that they've already built. Uh, and then uh, an example of one of the, um, they're actually, Volkswagen is producing their own charge stations as well as ch uh, charge facilities that they go to. Um, the other part, which I found interesting when he started talking about batteries, things I hadn't heard before, uh, cost constraints will shift. Uh, and he maintained that ultimately the metal will become the major constraint. And today, uh, it's other aspects of it. Um, they're going to shift from nickel to lower cost magnesium, and metal is the cost right now. Um, and I, this one I'd never heard before. Maybe others know more about batteries. Anodes drive 
the power um, ability of a battery and the cathodes drive the range, that is the amount of energy which is stored. I, I'm gonna look at more literature, see if I can understand why that's the case. Uh, at 50% of today's cost is in the cathode. Uh, so that's where you see the lithium oxides. Um, the reason for solid state, they're looking for production in five years. The secret sauce is the separator. That is, they're not telling anybody how the separator works, but that's how they got uh, QuantumScape to be successful was the separator. Um, it eliminates 100 kilograms, you know, 220 pounds out of the weight of a car today. Uh, and removes the volume limitation on EV designs because it reduces the volume substantially. There's essentially, there's uh, no anode uh, and there's no electrolyte. So uh, the size goes down. And it surprised the Stanford researchers who hosted the meeting that Volkswagen sees that the manufacturing is simpler for solid state than it is for uh, wet uh, electrodes. Um, so uh, that's, to be proven and in this little diagram showing uh, the different uh, pieces here. Uh, also showing here where the cost pressures are. It was a good presentation. Lastly, they asked the question and said, uh, um, uh, how much battery do you think we need by 2030? And so while they were on the video, they did a calculation. Someplace between 18 and 20 terawatt hours per year of batteries need to be produced uh, by uh, 2030. Uh, they started listing all the factories that we have today. We're not at a terawatt hour yet. We're not even close. We're, we're about you know, a half a terawatt hour if we include all the factories in the world. I mean, it was a great presentation. You, you can pick it up if you want. I mean, it's a very short one. It's the shortest one that I've seen. Uh, you can do the two hour Volkswagen presentation on battery day uh, or you could look at this one from Storage X, which is just about 40, 40 minutes long. Um, I ran across this, and maybe somebody sent this to me. San Joaquin Drive Clean Rebate List. The reason I put this up was the definitions of different kinds of vehicles. Can I, Are you okay? Okay. Um, so it's the number of vehicles. <laughs> look at the number of vehicles that they have that qualify for rebates. Uh, this list right here are the, are the pure electrics. I didn't realize there's that many pure electrics that are production vehicles available. This is from 2019, was it? 2020, maybe. Um, and then hybrids, plug-in hybrids. And then there's, of course, the electric uh, scooters, whatever else. Um, it wasn't so much we were getting rebates from there, but... Uh, so my little note on here was, can you remember when there are three production vehicles we could choose from? <laughs> so my car comes up, the lease ends in August and I'm going, I don't know what to do. <laughs> okay, we have a new president, did anybody notice? Uh, that uh, has yeah. a, new, a new plan or actually has a plan. Um, I think Sonia might have sent this to me. I have some more on this. Uh, uh, it's a $174 billion uh, EV plan um, mm -hmm. that he reviewed uh, while visiting the Ford F-150 um, announcement. Mm -hmm. He's telling all the manufacturers, build domestically. We'll help fund you if we build domestically. Uh, and there's tax breaks and incentives for battery factories and grants and cost sharing, $15 billion um, to build 500,000 charging stations uh, by 2030. I hope they're all uh, DC charge stations. Uh, 45 billion in school and transit bus EVs. Says we're gonna see a lot more fleets in, uh, uh, in bus EVs. Um, 10 billion towards heavy EVs and 10 billion for a point of sale. So we're gonna see um, a lot of the vehicles that uh, we're buying, and, but it does not include luxury models. And then uh, the federal fleet and, uh, and USPS will be electrified. So we'll see what happens after that announcement on the, on the awarding of the 
uh, postal service trucks, whether they end up being more electrics. Yeah, I want to share something else here. Just a second. Um, Jerry, did you have yeah. the uh, proposed uh, rebate levels? Because we can. I, I, do, I let's go further. I I can't remember if I do or not. Um, I might. Yeah. Uh, the proposed rebate levels were starting, let's say, at 7,500, but then um, if the car was American made, it would go to 10,000. And if okay. the car was union made, it would go to 12,500. Oh, wow. No, I don't credit. have that. I don't have and that. I think that's, on, that's on the hood. And this is proposed. So, you know, we'll still have to wait and see what actually gets in. And then a little bit on the F-150. Everybody has a stopwatch, and I think if we're going zero to 60 in about 4.3, 4.4. You all hear the sound, right? Well, we haven't released it for our vet clock. I should be quiet. Mr. Right. President, how fast were you going? <laughs> okay, I'm just going to step on it. I'll come off at 80 miles an hour. Let's see what it is, okay? You ready? Mr. President, can I ask you a quick question on Israel before you drive? No, you can't. I'm not unless you get in front of the car as I step on it. <laughs> <laughs> on the okay, here we go. You ready? See it, sir. You ready? So Caleb, recognize that track? Yeah, I've driven on that track. <laughs> yeah, me too. Mr. President. This sucker's quick. How does it How's it drive? drive? How does it drive? Would you buy one of these? I would. <laughs> I thought that would be fun. So what was this thing about putting pressure on Israel that was in the translation? That's Anything just a, a, a oh, no, that, Yeah, they wanted to get, they, this had to do with uh, the issues that were happening in, in uh, um, Palestine. Just, Palestine, thank you very much. <laughs> a quick question about the, um, the 15 billion on the, all the more chargers. Is there anywhere um, that you've seen anybody seen any more detail on that? Because it's, you know, that's a bit of a messy zone. Could be done better instead of just. I don't so, think I have a detailed plan. At least I haven't seen anything out there um, in terms of what they're doing. But there's there has been a lot of advocacy for, you know, DC fast charging. Um, yeah, I don't know I don't think anyone's seen anything in, in uh, journalism yet. Hmm. Well, I mean, having experienced the medley of different DC fast chargers and the how they pretend not to pretend the other ones exist, there, there, there needs to be a little bit more collaborative. Um, you know, it, do the plug and play functionality that's yeah. there, et cetera. Um, and, and some off-street parking solutions for people that don't have off-street parking. So. Yeah, that's it. Tar, you brought that up um, several months ago, saying we ought to have a presentation on the, the one Alan started uh, was the beginning of it. But I was looking for something more about you know what's going to happen uh, when we really get to it um, um, and we get more and more EVs. What's it going to look like and, and how does it get integrated? Um, at the very least, how do they get signage to tell you where to go to charge? <laughs> that would be one of the things to start with. Yeah. Um, the Pentagon is focusing on green. Um, they've announced that all non-combat vehicles will be electric by 2030, with a few exceptions. And some of those will be hybrids, plug-in hybrids. But uh, um, this was not that they would be buying by 2030. They will replace all of the vehicles by 2030 to be all electric. 
um, in the same article, it was talking about the Navy, Navy uh, already powers over two thirds by renewables, wind and solar. Uh, and that started during the Obama administration. And they did it as a money saving thing, uh, more than environmental. Uh, so it saves $400 million a year. Uh, but recently in this administration, they've created a new climate working group in the military to examine all military operations and what they should be doing. Uh, and, and, and Biden's gonna give the military more money. And the reason for giving them more money is so that they can do the um, uh, climate initiatives. Uh, one of the other pushes on that was uh, this one at the very bottom, uh, that military purchases help motivate the private sector. And if you look at the things that we have today, they started with ARPA, uh, and then the military starts buying and you know, GPS is really expensive, but once the military started putting one on every helmet or whatever, uh, you know, they became less and less expensive. Tor, <laughs> to your point. Um, so Title 24, as you and I have discussed, you know, it makes uh, modest EV changes, did not make the changes people were looking for. So the new Title 24 specifies that you have to, in multifamily dwellings, um, uh, bring either power or the capability for power to the parking structures. Um, existing building codes basically require 10% of the parking spaces to have circuitry available. Most cities, that's not really the case, even here in Sebastopol. Sebastopol is higher than that. Sunnyvale is certainly higher than that. Um, and the California Department of Housing and Community Development was pushing for more, but they got dismissed on this go around. It'll be another three years till there's another Title 24. Anyway, it requires now 40% of the spaces to have the electrical infrastructure and five to have a full EVSE installed. Um, we run into real estate and construction or against this kind of stuff because this makes uh, sales and building more complicated for them. Um, and then uh, they also spent a lot discussing whether level one, or level two, and as far as I can tell, level one qualifies. If you look at the Sebastopol code uh, and Sunnyvale code, they actually have uh, ratios and quotas uh, depending on the size of uh, parking spaces uh, or number of parking spaces as to how many at a minimum have to be level two. Oh, and the last one in the same article that got me was Michigan's on track to set a higher bar than California on, on charging stations in uh, multifamily dwellings where there's rentals. Um, Silverado, uh, GM's now an, an, uh, announced a Silverado EV pickup. I didn't know there was a Silverado pickup already. So I went looking into it. GM is uh, going to be using their Ulti Ultium. Ultium is that how you say it? Maybe no. Yeah, Ultium battery packs, which uh, are manufactured by LG, and they built a factory in Ohio, in uh, Lordstown, Ohio, uh, for for doing these. Um, and they're looking for a 400 mile range. This is a brand new vehicle built ground up. So the chassis will be entirely different in order to handle an EV. Uh, and they have two models, one model, which would be for retail, high finish, you know, you know, one of us might buy. Another one will be kind of utilitarian model, which is used for fleets um, that, that need this. And they've invested uh, uh, $2.2 billion in a new EV factory, uh, which is called Factory Zero. And in Factory Zero, they're also building the Humvee, which comes in both a truck and an SUV model um, with a 400 mile range. And uh, the GM also announced 30 new electric models by 2025. That, since we haven't seen a lot, I mean, that's kind of interesting. Um, and they're building a third electric factory. They have two already that they uh, either have completed one and they have another in the process. And they're selling their fuel cells to Navistar. 
So I don't know that they're using their own fuel cells, but they have come up with a fuel cell um, component that Navistar is going to be using on their vehicles. And Toyota is finally coming to the United States with EVs. Uh, they were the first with hybrids. They had a plug-in hybrid, uh, but they didn't announce what they're going to bring. <laughs> they're bringing uh, two models to the States. They sell them in China. They sell them in Europe. Um, but uh, uh, they still believe in fuel cells. <clears throat> Their 2025 goal is 40% of the sales will be electric, which is kind of funny since they're only bringing two models this year. And 70% um, of the sales, that's probably worldwide, will be electric by 2030. But the, in the presentation, they keep maintaining, they think that uh, um, you know, uh, plug-in hybrids is, is the place to be. Anyway, they, they have announced in a whole new business line called BZ, and there's a number of vehicles being sold in, uh, in uh, China in the BZ model. And they demoed a four-wheel drive uh, car that they're building with Subaru. with four motors or three motors, I think. They're getting better cars in China than we are. <laughs> I just made a list of uh, some of the ones that I saw from the Chinese show. And this was devastating for me as well. China's building fat EV factories faster than the rest of the world combined. Here's projection for Chinese factories building EVs. Here's the rest of the world. Here's the United States. And they're not cheap cars. And too bad Alan's not here. Um, uh, they said the, that most of the cars being sold are $40,000 or more that they're selling in China. And once again, somebody else uh, with it, here's a video on how to uh, replace uh, uh, posting, uh, replace your battery in your 2011-2013 uh, Leaf uh, with a 40 kilowatt hour pack. Uh, turns out it fits right in. And uh, 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 this company in Dale's EV Repair, in Dallas Re EV Repair, it's actually out of the UK. They'll send you the whole kit uh, and we'll program everything for you. <clears throat> and as you all know, I like to fly and uh, uh, NASA now created a whole new initiative. Um, people are always surprised that I can fly close to them. There's over, I forgot, I don't have a number on here, how many airports there are in the United States. And there's like, oh, there it is. 50, there's 5,000 airports in the United States. 0.6% of the airports have commercial service or handled 70% of the commercial service. What NASA is doing now is they're modifying uh, their plans to use all those airports um, for commercial service. And the reason they can do it is because of electric vehicle planes, electric planes, that they're looking at uh, 19 seat planes becoming available fairly shortly and 40 seat planes after that. And they're working on the 50 to 500 mile range um, trips. Most of them in the 200 mile range. So think of Fresno coming to San Francisco, or Fresno going to LA, um, uh, or you know here Santa Rosa. Uh, we actually go in a number of places. Instead of the larger planes, they could take smaller planes that with a smaller number of people and more flights. And part of this also is they're planning on automated aircraft uh, with backup remote pilots. So Bernie, you can go back to work again. You can do it from the uh, living room, right? You can be a backup pilot. <laughs> I'm in. You're in, okay, good. <laughs> and then finally, we have our first solid state EV car available. Um, uh, it has uh, 2,040 horsepower and go from 10, uh, in 10 seconds, go from zero to 200 miles an hour. Um, 
they're going to add, make it hybrid by 2023, hybrid, hybridizing it by having ultra capacitors so they can get more power out a little bit faster for the boost. Um, they have 450 watt hours per kilogram. Um, and it's derived, uh, the, the battery system is derived from a NASA design. And you can have one. Uh, the current price is $2.385 million. Well, considering and that's not a bad price. That's not a bad, not a bad price. And I put the little thing down at the bottom. And of course, it's Italian. <laughs> okay, peanut gallery. Sonia, bring up your point. So... Um, my point was that if we were thinking about the money that we currently have, um, how might we extend our reach uh, either within the North Bay or um, maybe beyond? Um, and I think that that kind of frames the conversation for maybe picking up some electrical and video equipment. But I had originally thought that um, you know, now is the time to spend all our money on getting people into electric vehicles, and that would include our $6,000. And so if there was something broader that we could do, um, and then my third point is that if we have any of those extra dark green shirts that you're wearing, Jerry, we should put them on people. So, like, you know, we should just get everything that we have and put it out there. That was my goal. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it for everyone to comment, but, you know, what else can we be spending our money on right now? Yeah, and Mike handed me this shirt, so I don't know where the shirts came from, but uh, I was manning a booth and Mike said, here, put this on. Yeah, it's Mike, Mike just might have a few more, and maybe some active members should get them. Whatever gets the word out. Yeah, well, oh. I can just say that uh, I have the shirts. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you have the shirts. I got them um, online. Them, yeah. They're really pretty cheap. Um, the only ones I have right now are mediums, by the way, but um, I've been trying to give them out. But let's, yeah, I'd be glad to order another whack of them, you know, get a bunch out here and just start giving them to people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other thing I thought, Sonia, is I like your idea. Um, because I love doing cross country travel on the in the electric, <laughs> I was thinking, boy, if we had a, a few, um, you know, portable video cams you know, that we could stick on cars and get some video footage on our, our website of, you know, of just trips, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. I think that we could, um, like, on following up on that point, um, if we could make our, our YouTube channel a little more general, just like a club channel, and then we could have like a playlist just for the meetings, and we could also have other videos hosted on the channel. Yeah, there's no yeah, reason why we can't fun. do that. Um, do you think yeah. that takes a little money, Cecilia, to like, I don't know much about, you know, should we be getting a more premium YouTube channel as part of that? Oh, no, no. I mean, it isn't, it's not like more money. It's just a matter of like, you know, how you, how you set it up, like, you know, channeling, yeah. Yeah. you can do yeah. playlists. That's like all like included in, I don't think you know, there's I, a paid YouTube I, level for creators. Yeah, I don't think there's anything that we could do there. Um, and I've been doing the minimum. I mean, see, you got me started on, on the YouTube. And so I follow my same pattern when I post the uh, club meetings, but I haven't investigated any other capabilities, except Zeno pushed me to make sure that uh, the presentation also was linked in there too, so. I wanna make a comment that Sonia, on the general question of increasing sales, you know, the point of sale in the, the salespeople at the dealerships, uh, whatever we could do to make them more proactive in selling EVs, I don't know if money would do it, but uh, <laughs> you know whether we give a sales incentive to the salespeople because you know they're reactive. The people have to come in looking for an EV. They do not, you know. I have yet to see a salesman in any of these dealerships who's really proactive in getting a potential customer and, and interesting, getting them interested in an EV. Well, Nissan here, at least Jim Bone, is somewhat different. I knew down the Sunnydale was too, <clears throat> because the sales guy who sells the EVs, he only sells EVs. Uh, so what if, we, what if we gave sales guy awards and brought them donuts and told them how wonderful they were? 
and made all of their colleagues jealous. <laughs> You know, I, I think donuts are our thing. And, um, you know, we could just, uh, you know, go to each of the, um, you know, each of the dealerships and find, you know, the best person that someone's recently worked with. And um, uh, I, I'm taking this idea from Laura Goldman, who uh, gave the city of Sebastopol an award one time just as a publicity stunt. And, uh, you know, I, I think it worked really well. I can't remember if anyone in this group was here, Woody was there. <laughs> yeah, I learned about the sales uh, are not taking care of themselves already, right? Uh, because policy and uh, regulations are pushing sales. And there's certainly enormous interest in, in buying these cars. So are we kind of late in pushing sales? Is that still needed? I'm. I wonder. And so are there other parts of the, uh, the complex issue of EVs and uh, autonomous vehicles that we want to shape more, like uh, the nature of the uh, recharging station? What is the ideal recharging station? How does it fit into uh, a local uh, economy or... Um, uh, local culture, like in a in a shopping center, how do you want to have that? Like what we have now is very uninviting, and we uh, we seem to kind of replicating the gas station as a, uh, a, a when when creating these recharging stations. So are there? I think there's need for things that are not already happening that that we could push more for. And, you know, on that, that line, that, that was the one, so, you know, I was thinking of, but I don't know where to go with it. The EVs are not visible. Um, one of the things that, you know, we notice is EVs are modeled the same as the gasoline powered vehicles today too. So unless you're looking and you know the brands, like I talked to my cousin in the East Coast, says, no, there's no EVs here. And I drive down the road and I can, I can see the EVs. Mm -hmm. The one place where the EV will look different is at the EV fueling station. Okay, fine. Even here in Sebastopol, unless you know where the charge stations are, or your car is telling you where the car charge stations are, or you're inside the infrastructure already, and you have you know, an app on your iPhone or on your iPad or whatever, um, finding a station is a difficult thing. And yet finding a gas station to drive down the road there's advertisements every place, next turn, come off at this exit. You know, uh, so our charge stations could become part of the advertisement for EVs because the cars don't look so different. And yet if we had signs that, uh, and I don't know how to do this, you know, signs that, that start talking about the next, you know, next exit, EV station, such and such. Um, well, even, even um yeah, even in Sebastopol, Jerry, like we could, we could talk to the city of Sebastopol about better signage um, off uh, South Main Street to yeah. next to the post office. Like, how would anyone know? Yeah. But um, once they get there, it's, I, I don't know, it, it would take, it would take a while for us to figure that out. Um, I mean, if we could, if we could buy a charging station and put it up, it would be kind of cool, but I assume that's more than Two or three thousand bucks. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, either that or if we could give people um, uh, charge point cards with money loaded into them or something like that. Yeah, but if you're getting charge point cards to people uh, with money loaded on them, it's going to be people that have EVs that we're giving them to, or people who are considering EVs ready. So, I, th I think the population we want to hit is the population that doesn't recognize that EVs are here. Mm -hmm. I, I just chime in that we just took a road trip with another couple and they're always and they're we talk about evs all the time but they're not they're hesitant about that range anxiety and so my next step with them let's go for a road trip in yeah. my ev you know so yeah. and we're going to charge up somewhere and i'll show you how how painless that is so they that's a common thing i mean people know about evs but they're there's that hesitancy so 
helping to overcome that is one thing. And then I did hear this podcast, this guy down in Georgia, he was driving, uh, he was an Uber driver or a Lyft driver, and he drove people around in his EV and his big EV evangelical. And so he's like, yeah, you, you give people a test drive without them even knowing or anticipating they were going to get a test drive by um, picking them up in an EV. So there's some thought to potentially helping more Uber or that whole world drivers, um, you know, have more EVs in that those fleets. And then I think the the whole, to Zeno's point about the charging network, that that's still a work in progress that needs more attention. Yeah. I mean, Sebastopol should have, or we still can request some Tesla chargers, et cetera. And, but that's just a part of the piece of the puzzle. And, and then the third thing would be have a monthly or um, critical mass drive. Just all the EVs show up and drive around town in a big parade just to show a show of mass. Because there's <laughs> a lot more EVs on the road and I'm noticing them. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> just to a little unofficial, unpermitted, parade down wherever town you're in <clears throat> and circle around and, and I don't know what else you want to do with that but just an idea to show that it's I Tor I like that I like that idea let me just jump in for a second and Caleb sure. will remember this too because Caleb and I uh at one point in uh Cupertino uh the Silicon Valley uh EAA um uh chapter uh hosted uh, an electric vehicle get together. And it was all uh, electric vehicle. I forget, was it just electric vehicles or was it green? It was electric vehicles, wasn't it? It was part of the Drive Electric Week event. Yeah. Yeah. So all kinds of vehicles. Some were bicycles, some were motorcycles, some were funky things, some were built. And other people were demonstrating their vehicles. And then we're going to have a parade and we wanted to break the record for the largest EV parade. So it went into the Guinness Book of Records. And I think we had 420 EVs in the parade. Now that just drove around two or three blocks, but the number of people who saw it was a substantial number of people. Um, so that idea of uh, maybe uh, some sort of an EV event that we could put together and use some of our funds to do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can go to you know, the Climate Center, Sonoma Clean Power, and the various cities and saying, we want to put an event together. Uh, and uh, you probably want this too. And we, we have in the Climate Committee in Sebastopol, a subgroup, which is just on transportation. By the way, anybody here who wants to join that group can join that group. Because uh, Tor joined the energy group. Uh, you don't have to be on the Climate Committee to do that. I'll just add another thing on my list, you know, about buying and selling EVs is, you know, we just, we just transferred from a 2017 Bolt to a 2020 Bolt and, and we got probably $150 cheaper per month by shopping around between Chevy dealerships because someone else was doing some research and shared that information with me. Hey, go down to Nevada, you can get a sweetheart deal. So that's that's kind of thing that you it's helpful in the moment because those things change all the time it's like yeah don't just go to the nearest dealership you'd be mm -hmm. you know i was surprised that two chevy dealerships were that much different in price and those that kind of from or or learn about whatever other dealership or how to get a tesla or whatever and so that just suggests that we figure out how to tap into some you know, some sort of a chat group or whatever discussion groups about these kind of things, whether it's our own or tap into some existing ones and sort of pull that information, make that accessible to people that visit MDEAA. Just because I, I think that's still value, that's still shifting and evolving, like how to buy, how to lease, the economics of either one. Um, that's a kind of common question that I have of people thinking about EVs and where to get in and what models and how much does it cost. And so they're Be thinking about it, but those are still sort of barriers or think questions people have. That would be interesting to host on our homepage somehow if we could find a way of structuring it so it was uh, easily um, uh, navigated. So somebody yeah. wants to lease, they want to buy and find out what the most, when I fly, um, if you fly, 
you know, uh, pilots constantly post what the gas price is at uh, various airports. Um, uh, and uh, since we need to refuel every 400 miles or so and going 50 miles out of your way is not such a big deal, uh, you know, a dollar difference a gallon um, makes a big difference. And, and uh, somehow they found a way for pilots to update that information that comes out on a regular basis. So I'm not sure how we do that too. Then the, the other the other area that might be a benefit is um, there's a lot of cars and coffee events around. That's I mean they're typically events geared towards you know gearheads and people who have you know fancy cars or tuned cars or hand built stuff. But there's a probably one of the largest cars and coffee events in the world is in down here in Orange County. There's two to three thousand you know participants every week every weekend they do this. And one of the headline sponsors is Polestar now. Oh. So you've got all these people bringing their, you know, super big engine cars, their supercars and things like that. But the, the main sponsor is, is Polestar and they're pitching their, you know, their electric Polestar too. And it gets a lot of attention from a lot of people who you wouldn't necessarily see in an EV typically. Um, so it's like you're really targeting the heart of car culture with with an EV that is interesting, so that that would be another place that perhaps you know as a as a group, you know anybody can participate in those. You don't have to; they're, they're typically free, so you can bring your EV and bring it into the event. And if it's interesting and unique, which most EVs are, if you live in an area where there aren't that many of them, uh, you can you can get a lot of people's attention that way. That's sort of the the party crash, right? <laughs> Yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. But yeah, on the on the driveway thing, I know I'm repeating this, but I got this, I got a flag <laughs> my EV that says so you know why I drive and so forth. And I thought if we did have an event, we could get a bunch of those. There's only like seven bucks a piece and and at least people would know what's going on because otherwise they might not even know there was a EV thing. Yeah, and would that be nice? I mean, Mike did this uh, the last time we had an EV event. I think Mike was the one who did the organization on it, and, and uh, uh, it wasn't simple, as I understand, to to put it together. But uh, it, it might be good for us to to take a look at doing an EV event. Maybe we do uh, we do a a parade as part of that. That wasn't part of what we did uh, last time, um, and figure out how that could drag more people in. Uh, as well. Actually, we, we, we have talked about this path and, you know, kind of COVID, COVID came along, but um, we do, we could do for, you know, a place for breakfast or something. And then, you know, together all over somewhere else with the ability and those little car flags like John's mentioning and then this, uh, uh, parade is is a good way to get some eye attention. Don't really know the car next to him is an EV. Yeah, you were breaking up a bit, Mike. But uh, ooh, now we lost it totally. We disappeared. Oh, there you're back. Okay, you were breaking up quite a bit. But the, uh, the one thing that you did uh, mention, uh, which sounded sound like a great idea. Uh, is you know have a breakfast event or whatever else, and we bring all the EVs to the breakfast event with signs, and do that in different places. That's another way to uh, uh, you know is less formal, but uh, you know um, it allows you to get the information out to more and more places, and people just walk up and talk to you about it. Yeah. Okay, moving onwards, Zeno. Uh, you are wrapping up, oops, sorry, wrapping up your talk on urban mobility. Yeah, uh, just a quick remark. Uh, so next month we have an outside speaker. And I think just out of politeness, it's probably good to give them like a time that they can start. No, I, I already, I'm, kind of, I'm already working with Tanya and I told her what time she'll start. So they could start at 11, for example. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's, that's standard for us, it would right. be at 11. We went a little bit longer today again. I'll watch it a little bit more closely next time. All right, so, okay. Um, so I need to share my screen.
Mm, yeah. So I one thing. So my title, ha, my talk has a different title. So maybe we can correct it on the website and in the wherever you put it on the YouTube or so. Oh, okay. I'm interested in this question and I, of uh, there's the mobility dilemma and that I will talk about. And I'm interested in the question whether electrifying mobility, uh, how that will affect uh, the mobility dilemma. And so, um, <clears throat> let me see here, yeah. Um, so what is the mobility dilemma? It's on the one hand uh, that our well-being, our social well-being, our economic well-being depends on our mobility. It tends to societies that are more mobile tend to have more resources, uh, better health in general even. So there's a lot of pluses to being mobile. But also, um, the way we move around has a lot of negative impacts. Uh, and with uh, the gas issue, it now even uh, impacts the world as a whole in terms of climate disruption, climate weirding, and stuff like that. So that's the dilemma. It has pluses and it has cons. Um, now, I, why do I call this a dilemma? Um, yeah, it's a dilemma because it not, you cannot really solve this problem, I think. It's something that needs to be managed, uh, but there always will be trade-offs. Um, uh, and, and we'll get back to that. But so what are the pros of mobility? Um, well, the economic prosperity to find employment, to get to your employment, to create employment. Uh, delivery and services, transporting goods, etc. So there are a lot of economic pluses to being more mobile in a society. Oops. Uh, and then there's also social, social well-being. So there is uh, seeing friends, visiting places, uh, just the joy of moving around in in mobile is a is a plus, maybe not often recognized by engineering types that tend to look at mobility as a um, kind of something that needs to be uh, shortened and faster. But there's a lot of ecstatic um, joy in, in moving around. Uh, mobility gives you a, a broader worldview. You meet people that you normally don't meet, uh, strangers, or you can uh, interact with people that um, you become more and more familiar with acquaintances. And so this mobility is kind of a part of a meaningful life these days. Yeah, if you, people that are stuck at home all the time um, are perceived as having a poorer um, set of relationship and meanings in their life. Uh, and, but there are also costs uh, to mobility and we're all familiar with it. So. I will not uh, spend a lot of time, but certainly there's a depletion of natural resources going on because of um, of the way we move around. There's uh, pollutants, uh, not just the greenhouse gases and other gases, but there's also uh, copper that comes off the, the brakes. There is uh, stuff that comes off the tires that we had a presentation about that uh, gets into the creek, that uh, it really affects uh, salmon, for example, in this area. Uh, and then there was, as we mentioned, the greenhouse gas emissions. So there are a lot of environmental costs to how we uh, organize our mobility. And as we saw today in some of the uh, examples, what we're doing right now is we replacing our existing mobility structure we're trying to imitate that way of doing things uh, electrically. So we still um, hope that the military would show our, our way where we go with mobility. Ideas that come out of the military are useful. Bad idea, I would say, right? Bad idea to give the military uh, a guiding lead in how we move around because that's not really very friendly, very meaningful to people. So they need, you need to have to be very aware of that. Um, 
So there are other mobility costs, there are social costs, there are traffic accident, there are uh, air pollution, health, livability. There's a lot of noise coming off the way we move around. Um, yeah, yesterday I had a coffee with a friend in their backyard and um, there were all these planes that come over all the time, right? That's, that's a bad thing there. And it was hard to get a conversation going. So um, there's obesity um, that comes out of the sedentary lifestyle. Obviously obesity has other causes too, but uh, we don't we don't use our body anymore so much as we used to do like 200 years ago. Um, there's a loss of public space in the way we organize our mobility here in the United States, um, where we meet people. Um, there is uh, like the way we uh, move around, we look at each other through these little windows and we barely see the other people in the other cars because they're behind their own little tinted windows. So I always think about uh, mobility and with cars as a, a one-way mirror. You can look out, but you cannot really look in very well, right? Um, so the practical effect of that car culture is uh, alienation. Um, there is uh, communities get separated in all kinds of ways. Uh, uh, some people, the way they move around is not, uh, doesn't fit the pattern. So they, in, a, in many ways, they become less mobile. Uh, and then there's inequities between social groups. And, and we'll find some examples later. Um, yeah, and then there are economic costs. Yeah, there's uh, traffic congestion. Uh, if you, everybody uh, has been in LA and it's terrible there and uh, the cost of the vehicles, the vehicle is a big expenditure for many families. Um, and then the cost of the infrastructure. Uh, I mean, the police, uh, the police is so built into the car culture. It's unbelievable, right? Uh, there's only police, so much police because we have a car culture. But also the police kind of uses the car culture to enforce its, uh, its uh, structure on society. So there's a lot of cost um, to uh, mobility, the way we organize mobility. Um, now, now what I'm talking about is I'm uh, uh, electrification, but I'm meaning with electrification something broader than just um, uh, the, the car itself, yeah? So we, have, we need new ways to generate power. Often this power will be created more locally uh, by wind and solar, uh, rather than being uh, brought to um, the car from uh, um, far, far away. Um, we need a uh, new energy delivery system. We need more load management. So there's like a network behind this idea where you connect cars with each other or at least with the, with the grid in some new ways with information. Uh, but it also could create new ways to donate and share, right? So if I have solar uh, and I have excess energy, I could donate, donate that to the grid for people that are less well off. Yeah, so maybe that network can also be taken uh, in a positive way. And then there are all kinds of gadgets and capabilities that come out of uh, electrification. And then probably most exciting to lots of car manufacturers is the, um, uh, <clears throat> the automated vehicles, the, the autonomous vehicles that can drive on their own. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, so this is kind of a part of the presentation I gave last time that mobility has increased a lot. But what I think want to single out in again is that the time we spend in mobility has in this particular case, uh, and this looks at Britain and people going to work, that time has more has stayed more or less the same. And so you can kind of wonder, why is that? Uh, are we, we kind of accepting that that was a take to be 
on my way to work, yeah? And it has been the same for about 50 years. We drive faster and we go further, but at the same time is spent in, in traffic that um, for, for the last 50, 60 years or so. So is that something, what does that reflect? That's kind of an interesting question for me. Um, it kind of reflects um, the value of our time and the things we can do in the car, right? That we accept so much time that we can, maybe people love to be alone, yeah? For a while, they need to be alone, but they're constantly surrounded by people. And so the car is a way to be alone. That could be part of why we accept that particular uh, to, to ours, uh, well, I'm not even sure how much ours there are. It's twice as much as uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. It's interesting that you mentioned that one because in the Volkswagen presentation, one of their pushes was, we're changing the car into becoming a, a living room for you because yeah, uh, you, we're spending time here. Yeah. I'm going to use that word living room, so don't uh, steal my, my punchline. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I, I also showed this last time. This shows you in the same set of data in England, um, the, the modal uh, split of uh, how people move around. And so walking has gone down from 60 to 10%. Uh, and car use has gone up dramatically, right? So that is a trend. And the question is, will that trend continue? Will people um, use public transportation last? and all move to the private car. Uh, with people um, work, uh, is will the infrastructure and the layout of, of our uh, built environment be such that we cannot really work to, walk to work anymore so much, but we all have to move to some form of supported mobility. And uh, if the trend continues, it will be a, a car or a van. Okay, so I also mentioned this a lot of time, and this is kind of interesting. So I remind you that people love owning a car because it has all kind of benefits that are even not uh, that it has to you that have nothing to do with uh, driving the car itself. Just the potential that you have this car in front of your house and you can use it any more time is is money is is a value to people. And we all know this, for example, in, in, uh, when there is an emergency, like a forest fire, um, and we, want to need, we need to move quickly out of harm's way. We like that security of that private car in front of our house so we can move at, at our own decision as soon as we feel we need to. Yeah, so that's an example. And so, um, this study kind of tries to uh, monitor, put numbers on that and, and find that people value having a car uh, more than what the car on average costs them, but also they value it for these reasons that have nothing, uh, not immediately to do with um, actually using the car, but the, just the potential moving the car and the, the status of having this car. Um, is, is another um, part of the, um, the value that the car has for people. Okay, so uh, I mentioned this already. I call this a dilemma because there are uh, conflicts and trade-offs that cannot really be solved completely. It will always be with us, I think, and it will always require um, managing and weighing the pros and cons. Unfortunately, lots of the pros are are for certain people and the cost of the car are for other people. So there's a lot of inequity in transportation. I mean, we all know that uh, when the highway system uh, got created, um, certain communities got impacted by the creation of the highway. The whole neighborhoods were separated in, in two parts that could not easily communicate anymore. And I was reminded of this also when I traveled in Chile. And this is probably true in other countries. So in Chile, there are toll roads that are built for um, managing that very thin, long country. 
uh, and so you pay substantial money for being on the toll road. But when you do, when you drive on the toll road, uh, you notice that people walk along the road. And at some point there is a crossover, so you can climb over the road and then you go down again. So people, before the toll road, people were able to walk to their friend's house, to their work, and now they have to walk like 20 times as far, maybe, I'm guessing here. So a road is also a barrier. That's kind of my point here. A road is a barrier. A road is a point, it's a way from getting to A to B for people that can use the road. But if you cannot use the road, you have to go around the road, right? And the road becomes a barrier. And so in the whole idea of road kill, animals often experience our road system as a set of barriers, the dangerous places where they might, uh, might find their end if they're not um, attentive. So that's the dilemma. It's, um, it's a problem that needs to constantly be managed and discussed. But the, the, the benefits are often uh, accruing for people different than the people that, uh, that uh, have the burdens of the, of the mobility solution. Okay, so in order to, um, I have like 17 minutes left. Um, so I want to kind of have five conjectures of the impact of automated autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles on our mobility dilemma. And this is an immense topic and I'm not qualified to discuss all the aspects of it. So I'm just giving five examples of where I think it will, this will go. Um, so the, my first conjecture is that the car use and vehicle mode travel will actually increase because of automated vehicles. Uh, and why is that? Well, there are three mechanisms. One is that um, faster travel with the same time implies more fecal mind travel. So if we accept that time as a given, as a natural uh, expression of a balance of desires that we have, if we have the same time to be in traffic, but the, um, auto the autonomous vehicles allow us to go faster they allow us to uh, stack more cars in the same space. Um, so there will be more vehicle mode travel just because of that, that, that feature of the uh, autonomous vehicle. There will be induced demand. Yeah, so this is a well-known thing in transportation that if you build a better highway, people will say, hey, I didn't go, no, I could go so easily to the city, San Francisco, and I'm now willing to take that uh, trip because it's more easy. So there will be an induced demand because of uh, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles. Uh, and there may even be, uh, the government may say, well, we have special lanes for auto autonomous vehicles. Like we have now uh, these lanes for uh, zero uh, emission vehicles and, and, and carpool lanes. Uh, I would foresee that in the future we will have special lanes for automated vehicles. So that creates also kind of an inequity between people that have the money to buy these vehicles and, and people that don't have that or don't make the decision not to have that. Just like now, uh, all the subsidies, uh, all the, the fast lane tends to favor people with money, right? That's It's just a fact of of our system right now. And then also, uh, and this comes to what Gary kind of tried to steal my thunder here um, with the idea of the, the living room. Uh, so if you have an automated vehicle, uh, the vehicle uh, allows you to use it without being engaged with the, the, the control, right? So you have other, you can do other things with that. And so we already know that the car is kind of an, a, a part of your living environment. A car in some way is a way to get around without leaving your house, right? Um, I mentioned already the alienating effect of looking through the car window to the outside and seeing other people that are vaguely present in the car window. 
So you're still at home, as it were, when you use a car. Some people, they go in their garage, they open, they go in their car, they open the car door and the garage door, and they move out. So they never even experience the outside. Um, so I think this will, this, this tendency that the role that a car has in our society will increase with, um, with getting electric and uh, autonomous vehicles. And so that's probably what Volkswagen hopes it will do. Yeah, so we will start doing other things in the car that we cannot really do whilst just driving around, like reading a book, um, emailing, social media, sleeping, snacking, or maybe even maybe making love in a car, right? So you kind of have extra time and what are you going to do at that time? So my um, prediction is that we will be willing to spend more time in a car in the future when they become autonomous because a new set of activities is opened up to us that we were not able to do in a car before, right? So cars will become even more living rooms or bedrooms uh, than, they, um, than they already are. Okay. So this is the, uh, so I kind of explained that already. So the timeline that is here in this, uh, in this graph is constant. And I believe that in the future, this will uh, increase. So we will have more time that we spend inside the car because the range, as I said, the range of activities that we do in the car will be uh, changing. So we will add new things to do in the car. And so we are, replacing some of the time being in a cafe or being at home, now be in the car because we want to go somewhere, uh, but it doesn't cost us really any driving time because we do the same thing in the car that we would do in these other locations. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the effects of the fecal mode travel increase and time in transport there will be an increase in sedentary lifestyle. There will be an increase in sprawl. Yeah, because we accept being traveling to work better than we did in the past. So I live in Cloverdale. I have a job in San Francisco. I don't mind. Yeah, because I step in my car, it drives me there. I do uh, some research. I watch a film and then I'm refreshed and step out of the car in San Francisco. And so this will be an increase in sprawl. And I, I also mentioned there will be an increase in alienation while the car is a private room with practically one way mirrors as window. Okay, the two, the second one, we kind of uh, talked about that today already that, uh, Combustion engine refueling is kind of democratic, right? I mean, some people may have a chauffeur that fills the car up for them, but we all go to the same location and we all have to stand in line independent of our wealth or uh, social status. And we have to fuel our car and the time it takes, it doesn't take longer for, um, for, a, for a, a poor person and a rich person to fill up the car. So it's, it's kind of very democratic on the whole. But EV charging is very different. EV charging has two locations. One is your private location and the other is the public location. And if you do not have the type of circumstances at your home where you can do private, you're always dependent on the public thing. And it may get shorter and shorter but it will be very inconvenient for people, much more inconvenient for people to do that elsewhere outside their private environment than to do it in that driveway, yeah? In that driveway, you can uh, plug it in and get it off the next morning when you want to use the car. Even if you live in a, an apartment building and there is electric charging there, your neighbor will get upset because you're you're hogging the, the charging station. Your car has been charged already two hours ago, so they will put pressure on you uh, to move your car. So there will be an, a lot of inconvenience for people that cannot do private charging. Uh, that's my prediction. And then also there may be a cost difference. So if you have 
private charging with solar. And Jerry already mentioned that to him that he made a little money having that solar for himself. Uh, if you have that, uh, charge your own car. We'll, uh, at home with your private solar, maybe a backup battery and stuff like that, all that good stuff that will be um, uh, having a cost benefit in relation to people that do not have that kind of possibility. So there will be um, two types of uh, uh, <clears throat> people. One that can uh, that are kind of held by the electric uh, vehicle structure in terms of convenience, and there's another set of people that move from a democratic uh, refueling of the combustion engine to a much more bothersome, irritating environment uh, of recharging. So that's my prediction of the, my conjecture. And then also the third one is that um, automatic vehicles will affect the, me the motor split in favor of cars. So the trend that we saw in the English data will continue but it will be, uh, in, that effect will increase. So I'm, in, I'm predicting that active, not network mobility, like walking, bicycling, will be the loser in this battle. And why is that? Well, it's because there's no money in it, right? If I walk somewhere, nobody makes a dime. So nobody pushes me to not walk. I mean, people push me to not walk so they can make a dime. Yeah, and that's how our society works. We have private initiative, people want to sell a product, and um, there's no product really in walking. Or even a conventional bike, there's very little cost involved, and it's not, it's not a big business. Uh, so th that kind of transportation, I think, will be a loser because it's not monetized, there's no effect on GNP, and there's no financial interest that pushes on this. Yeah, there are non-profits and some government that says walk to work, but there's not a business that makes it business of making people more because it, it's not monetized, right? So that's, that's I think, uh, a reason where this, why this trend is continuing. When you look at the research that being done on um, automated vehicles, uh, like university research, at MIT, uh, the all the urban futurism, all that research is focused on automated vehicles with disregard of walking and biking. So lots of the, the technological solutions almost show no people that walk. So they come up with ideas that can only be implemented if we push people even further from the street, yeah, because it in order to run these cars and these systems um, safely, people are, are an obstacle. So uh, that's kind of what I have seen here. Um, and so I had a little aside here about jaywalking. So I think you can, you can kind of see the power of uh, car companies in different cultures by whether these cultures allow jaywalking. And countries and states in the United States differ in jaywalking laws. For example, in the Netherlands, there is not even a word for jaywalking. Right? And I have a link there. Um, and in California now, there is a law introduced uh, uh, a couple of days ago, the Freedom to Walk Act, by a Democratic Phil Tang, an assembly member, uh, that proposes to decriminalize jaywalking. So there's some movement here. And here's an example of the Netherlands, people jaywalking. So this is how people use the streets uh, in a uh, combined modal uh, situation where there's cars, there are bicycles, and people are in some cities even now encouraged to use the street and it's kind of a way to calm traffic. Yeah, so just imagine Sebastopol, uh, jaywalking is very uh, looked badly upon right now. You have to use the uh, cross lights, the certain places where you can cross. 
Just imagine that we started controlling traffic in Sebastopol by having people cross the street all the time. So that would be an enormous change in which how we uh, are present on the street. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> the other effect of electric vehicles will be on the re-energizing station. So that's the, my word for gas station and, uh, and recharging station. Since it will, it takes more time to recharge, <clears throat> and the uh, at, at at the present at least the um, the reach of the, the electric vehicle is smaller. There will be more and larger charging stations in comparison with gas station, right? So obviously this is kind of a conjecture, it depends on technology, so technology, but that seems at least for the while to me a, a good, but it also People, what do people do with that time when they sit there and recharge? Well, the commerce will take um, charge of the situation. So we will be interested in what, what people do in that time. So can we sell them something? So <clears throat> Tesla actually has uh, filed for a trademark for its uh, name it's a T that is used as a logo and for another um, graphic connected with the word Tesla uh, in the restaurant category. So Tesla may become a restaurant chain or a franchise at least. So there will be an effort to monetize that changed cultural, social, place here um, uh, with respect to these recharging stations. So earlier I talked about recharging stations. I think this is an opportunity for people with a little bit more creative playfulness and a social conscience to make this less of a like commercial space and more a fun downtown thing where uh, the benefits accrue to a broader set of people in the community. Okay. Uh, I also, I earlier talked about embedded transportation when I talked about it a month ago, and I think that's also going to be increased. Um, but let me end on a positive note. It is 12 o'clock. So automated vehicles are much cheaper to operate, you know, because of a large car, uh, um, a large part of a, uh, like a, a bus, a city bus, and a large part of the cost to operate the bus is the um, uh, paying the driver, right? So I think that this is an opportunity to have smaller, more frequent shuttles to replace these buses. Uh, that could become tools for small town to intensify public transportation. And I think if I remember correctly, they trying something out like this in Toronto right now. Um, so that could be a, um, a, a, a ending on a possible uh, positive note um, in my presentation. Thank you. So I had a couple of comments on which had the VMT one, uh, as far as the VMT going up, that actually was uh, Sonoma State's conclusion after a year long study that automated vehicles would increase VMT. The buses, your last positive note, uh, the major cost in, in uh, providing transit is the driver, uh, not the infrastructure, not the vehicle, it's the driver. So if we have automated vehicles, we might have more frequent bus routes and maybe we won't have so many cars. Because if the bus ran every ten minutes in Sebastopol, I might take the bus. So, and, well, and the walking, the walking as far as the, the jaywalks, uh, having been in California in the '60s, uh, I used to walk across the street here wherever I wanted to, and that was fine. And the cars had to stop. And then I went to Pittsburgh and stepped in the street and almost got killed. That's changed over the last forty years in California, fifty years in California, where we now need a law to allow that. Uh, David, I see your hand up. Yeah. 
uh, well, thanks a lot, Zeno. This is very uh, thought stimulating, and you know we can get disconnects in this process, though. Uh, uh, Jerry, what you're saying about you know, vehicles allowing more public transit, I mean, the next step beyond that is that these individual autonomous vehicles could, uh, uh, you know, form virtual trains themselves and have the same impact on reducing traffic. And, and so the autonomous vehicle potentially totally revolutionizes what the concept of public transit is. And I think the pandemic puts another twist on this is, you know, is it gonna be safe to continue to put people in vehicles with 50 passengers? And, and of course, somebody I made that comment to said, oh, the air filtering systems are gonna be so good. But I think the alternative that all of these other things come together to give you uh, uh, autonomous uh, uh, self-forming uh, virtual buses, virtual trains and all that type of thing. And uh, just think about these things that you've said about all oh, the inconvenience and the class uh, effects of charging. Uh, look at the robot vacuum cleaners. They can <laughs> not only be autonomous when they're vacuuming, they go charge by themselves. They unload the their dirt, and the, the, you have to look at these. Uh, that's where this car stuff is going. That heck, we could, our cars could be charging while we're waiting in line at the uh, uh, drive-through at a fast food restaurant. You know, all of this charging can happen without you having to get out and plug the car in. And uh, it, you know, they've done that to some degree with uh, buses. But I think we're going to see, you know, contactless charging and then the car can go charge itself and nobody needs to go and attend the car or find something else to do while the car is charging. The car can charge uh, as part of its uh, uh, normal routines and, and uh, there's going to be uh, a very different infrastructure for charging. John? John, uh, you're on mute. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's cool. One, one of the things I think uh, Zeno's information kind of warns us about is that if we, I, I think maybe if we let uh, this new technology uh, just get run by the economy, it'll go the way of a lot of, a lot of things, you know, media, whatever. Um, so maybe one of our jobs will be to think about how to, how to insert different thinking into the way some of these structures are developed, like what, how, you know, just inserting the idea that, that, uh, you know, autonomous cars don't have to be owned, for instance, or, uh, you know, work in, in with the structure so that, so that we work with municipalities or whatever, so that there could be a non-ownership type of vehicle structure where people don't have to. And, and, you know, that kind of fits with, with some of the, some of the younger people now, I don't know if this is really everybody, but I talk with a few people, young, young folks that don't really want to get their license or don't right. even really want to own a vehicle and it's like what the heck yeah. you know why do i want to do that <laughs> so what if we could make use of some of some of the directions that are happening to kind of stimulate non-ownership and thereby having possibly fewer fewer vehicles i don't know uh, or vehicles that are that are owned that maybe with a longer lifespan anyway and bernie oh you're on mute yeah take that off uh, Tesla, you know, is, is planning to put out a, a, a software program that's going to operate like Uber and uh, Lyft and uh, people who own Teslas that have uh, the automatic uh, uh, driving system will, you know, will be able to make their cars available when, you know, diff different points during the day, whenever they want, where, whenever they don't need them, they can make them available for others to order them up and, you know, they'll just drive themselves to pick up people and take them uh, to the store or whatever. Yeah, Anybody I do else? think that yeah, is yeah. the expectation of the auto industry is there's going to be a demand for fewer vehicles per person, the per capita number of cars. I mean, what, aren't we more than one car per person in Sonoma County? And that absolutely will have to change. <laughs> Uh, now I, tr I try to drive at least two at a time anyway. Uh, yeah. Anybody else? Zeno, thank you. Oh, let me switch over here to the other window. Uh, and I had still some of the same links. I think I added uh, a, a couple other s short links here, but 
we can answer more of the web page. Uh, next meeting, uh, Tanya Nareth is going to talk to us, and she's the director of uh, the Regional Climate Protection Authority. Um, and I'll send her some notes. I think, Zena, is she going to try to focus on transportation and their efforts in that area? Uh, well, we need to uh, maybe uh, uh, help her shape a presentation. Okay, so I'll, send, I'll send her a note because she asked for when the next meeting will be and uh, the Zoom link. And I'll create that as I'm posting the video today. Nice. All right. Thank you, everybody. And I'll see you all next month. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank bye. You. Bye, y'all. Thank uh, Thanks a lot, Jerry. This was great. Sure. See ya. Bye, Caleb. Okay.